Yes, yeah, so today um, we're going to shift gears and talk uh, instead about pathogens, uh, of human pathogens that are in animal manure, we'll talk a little bit about animal pathogens that are in animal manure. Um, so I'm here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, at UNL in the Veterinary Diagnostic Center. And um, our role here is that we provide veterinarians and producers with testing needs for um, a lot of these pathogens and uh, help them solve some of the issues they may have with their livestock. So instead of uh, how Lisa presented going from uh, the, the, the most impactful to the least, I'm going to the, go through the, uh, the most simple types of organisms, the viruses, and then end with the parasites. So when we think about viruses that are uh, pathogenic to animals, um, the most simple one that we have is called a rotavirus. So um, each animal species uh, has many types of rotaviruses that they get. Um, these are very simple viruses. They're non-enveloped, meaning they don't have um, an envelope on their surface. It's mainly protein. Uh, they're an RNA virus, so they have RNA as their genomic material. Animals typically become susceptible when they're two weeks of, old, two weeks of age, uh, and then their susceptibility wanes as they become older and their immune system matures. Uh, here in Nebraska, this is the second most common cause of diarrhea we see in cattle, um, older than a week. Uh, so originally, we, these viruses were called the Nebraska calf diarrhea virus. Uh, and as we did more and more research, we learned that they're a type of rotavirus. These types of viruses are very diverse, so the immunity is variable. So for example, if they in, get infected and become immune of, to one type of rotavirus, they may still be susceptible uh, to other types may be similar to noroviruses in humans. Uh, one of the challenges with dealing with rotaviruses in animal populations is they're very stable in the environment. So once your, um, once your farm or uh, environment becomes contaminated with rotaviruses, these can persist for months. And they're very stable depending on the, uh, the temperature and humidity that the virus is exposed to. Uh, some management processes are, include sanit sanitization and age segregation, which we'll talk about how that works at cattle at the end of the presentation. And there are vaccines available for a variety of species. Um, as we um, progress through the viruses, another common pathogen that is found in manure are the enteric coronaviruses. So when we say enteric, that means these are viruses that infect the digestive system of the animal. Uh, coronaviruses are a common virus that infects those, uh, those cells in a variety of animal species. These cause diarrhea in, in young animals, very similar to rotaviruses. The differences are that this is a larger enveloped RNA virus, so they're less stable in the environment and can be more easily decontaminated and removed than rotaviruses. When we think about uh, the animal populations that are susceptible, they're usually young. They have not quite had uh, their immune systems become mature yet uh, in about one to four weeks of age. This is the most common cause of diarrhea that we see in calves uh, is the bovine enteric coronavirus. Um, this one is also different in that it can affect adult animals and cause a disease called winter dysentery. Um, in swine, we recently had several of these emerge uh, in the US, and it's thought to have come from China. These include porcine epidemic diarrhea virus and porcine delta coronavirus. Um, we have several active research projects going on with these at UNL. And if you look at the picture in the top right corner, you can see this is um, uh, a section of a swamp pig intestine that's been infected. The red color is the viruses. So when the virus infects those cells, them from absorbing, um, absorbing the water from their gut, uh, and then you, they get signs like the um, uh, like the animal below where they have diarrhea. <clears throat> um, things like biosecurity can be really impactful. Um, if you can prevent this, these types of viruses from getting on your farm, that's probably the best way to go. Um, there are some vaccines, and then uh, when we talk about cattle, age segregation can be important in breaking the disease cycle. Uh, another virus type is the pestivirus. These include one that um, anyone who may have cattle may have heard of called bovine viral diarrhea virus. Uh, and in swine, there's a similar virus called classical swine fever, or what used to be known as hog cholera. Um, through a, a, a very strong uh, disease eradication program, 
uh, CSF was eliminated and it's now foreign um, to the United States. Um, but BVD is still around and causes a, a large amount of problems. This is an enveloped RNA flavivirus. Uh, so these are enveloped, so they're not very stable in the environment, um, but they still can cause problems. And then the fa family flavivirus um, is similar and related to many of the mosquito-borne viruses like Zika, for example, that are, are now in the, in the press. So the, the main challenge with pestiviruses is they cause a persistent infection if they infect the uh, young animals when they're in utero or when the, their mothers are still pregnant with them. When that happens, they become tolerant of the virus. They don't develop an immune response, and they're infected for life. Uh, when this occurs, they, uh, they shed billions of virions or virus particles in the feces in the respiratory tract, and then are a reservoir on the farm that can infect uh, all, their, uh, all the other animals that are exposed to them. There are vaccines uh, for these viruses. Uh, so between vaccination and testing for these animals that are persistently infecting, uh, persistently infected and removing them, uh, this disease can be controlled. Uh, we did talk about uh, uh, Shigatoxin E. coli. Um, so uh, all animals tend to have their own types of E. coli that are adapted to them, and have they have acquired specific virulence factors uh, that that cause disease in that animal species. So when we think about uh, toxigenic or E. coli that produce toxins uh, in mammals, uh, these tend to cause diarrhea. If you look at the slide here, uh, the picture on this slide, you can see that the red uh, stain there are E. coli bacteria in the intestine uh, of, a, of a pig that has been infected with E. coli. <clears throat> They're able to colonize due to these fimbri. If you remember the picture that Lisa had up of the, of the bacterial pathogen there, it looks kind of like a bristle brush. These are due to those fimbriae, and they're very sticky and allow them to colonize the intestine. Um, they are specific to proteins that are only expressed at a certain age. So for example, animals that are a week of age may be susceptible to these types of diseases because they have these proteins. Uh, they produce toxins similar to diseases like cholera uh, that cause an increase of secretion of fluid into the gut uh, and then diarrhea and dehydration in the young animal. So again, vaccines um, and in cattle, age segregation can be important in, in uh, reducing the impact of this disease. Salmonella, similar to salmonella in humans, these can be uh, have a wide variety of species, age ranges, and hosts that they can um, infect. Uh, they cause diarrhea. Uh, in animals, you can have asymptomatic shedding animals, sort of like typhoid Mary. Uh, typhoid is a type of salmonella that um, you can be uh, colonized with the pathogen but not have any clinical signs uh, and that you can infect other other animals. Uh, there are host adapted strains so these pathogens have evolved to infect a specific type of animal uh, and cause a severe disease um, and these uh, include Salmonella cholera suis in pigs and Salmonella Dublin in cattle. Um, so <clears throat> another strategy that's important for salmonella is to prevent introduction, uh, to test the animals and, and quarantine them if you do purchase new animals to limit spread. And then there are vaccination available. Uh, Mycobacterium paratuberculosis is a bacteria that causes a disease called Yoni's disease. This is an important bovine pathogen that's present in about 60% of dairy farms and fewer beef herds, about 8%. Um, ruminants, including sheep and goats and cattle, can get infected at birth. So the pathogen must be present in the environment that they're born in. Uh, they agent, ingest it and become infected. After they're infected, the disease course can take many years, so five, six years, um, until the animal uh, develops a chronic diarrhea and has a wasting syndrome, as you can see in the picture, uh, where they then can shed a, a high amount of bacteria into the environment where other animals can become infected. This is stable for months in the manure and other environmental um, uh, environmental sources, depending on the humidity and the temperature. Uh, and then the real management strategy for this is to test and remove those infected animals to prevent um, this accumulating in the environment. There's no treatment for this disease once it, they become infected. Uh, Clostridium species is another important manure-borne bacteria. These are anaerobic, so they grow in uh, environments where there is no oxygen. Uh, to deal with oxygen environments, they form spores, which are very stable, uh, and these can become um, heavily 
uh, ubiquitous in soil and manure where animals have been. And some farms become very heavily colonized with the variety of spore types. Um, and these types of spores can, when infected, uh, when animals become infected with them, can cause diseases like blackleg. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with tetanus. This is caused by one of these types of bacteria. Botulism, uh, malignant edema, and hemorrhagic enteritis. Uh, some of the strategies to deal with these include uh, vaccinating with seven-way or other clostridium-based vaccines. Um, if your animals are at risk, you can use things like antitoxin. Uh, if you're doing castrations or shearing, where they may have a higher risk of uh, acquiring clostridium. Um, and then you can prevent uh, risky practices like bruising or other trauma where these bacteria can be um, infect the animal. Uh, cryptosporidium, which we'll hear a little bit more later, uh, and how this can impact human health and environments. Um, but these are uh, not a bacteria or a virus. They're a protozoan, so they're a single-celled eukaryotic organism. They're transmitted from infected food or water uh, that has been exposed to feces from uh, an in another infected animal. These can become a, a challenge to deal with because they're resistant to disinfectants like chlorine. So it may take more chlorine than um, it would for a standard pathogen. Uh, they reproduce in the epithelial cells of the intestine of cattle and infected people. Um, these are very common where 90% of dairy farms have cryptosporidium and 40% of beef herds have cryptosporidium. Uh, typically the uh, age of animal that gets infected are one to three week old calves. Uh, to manage this, we don't have any treatments, but ensuring those animals have adequate immunity through colostrum and lowering environmental burdens through, uh, we'll talk about age segregation again in the next few slides, um, that can be very helpful. Again, this is one of the ones I'm talking about that is zoonotic and, and can be uh, have a low infectious dose for people. Uh, coccidiosis uh, or coccidia parasites are the final one that I'm going to talk about today. These are another protozoan parasite. Uh, they cause a bloody diarrhea or bloody scours in a wide range of hosts from ruminants, twine, poultry, and others. Each species of animal tends to have its own uh, type of coccidia that infects them and causes disease. Um, you will see uh, Animals infected from ages one month to a year. The disease severity is dependent on how many oocysts or those parasite eggs they ingest when they're young. It can take about two weeks from the ingestion of those eggs uh, until they have uh, a disease or diarrhea. These eggs can be stable in the environment. They're shed from those infected animals and they can accumulate. Depending on, again, the temperature and humidity, these can survive for up to a year. Um, in, in different environments. Uh, so they're uh, adequate immunity, good, good management of the health of the animals, and then there are drugs called coccidiostats, which can prevent infection from coccidia. So all these um, pathogens uh, seem to have an age-dependent predilection. So one of the management strategies that can be very important in, in helping reduce the impact you, these can have in your farm, uh, one is called the Sandhill, Sandhills Calving System. And this was uh, tested in the sand hills of Nebraska uh, to try and break these disease cycles. Um, so since uh, the calves that are one to two to three weeks of old of age are the ones that tend to get infected and shed um, a lot of uh, pathogens into the environment, if you move the pregnant animals every two weeks away from the cow-calf pairs, then those calves will be born on a clean pasture. And you can reduce the amount of pathogens that they're exposed to when they're first born. And that can go a long, long way to, um, to breaking these disease cycles and reducing the impact of manure-borne pathogens on your calves. Similar um, in swine operations, when we want to think about uh, management strategies we can use to reduce the impact of pathogens on the swine. Uh, production systems like all in, all out can be very important. So you always have swine that are the same age and at the same, um, uh, sort of the, the same uh, parts of the system. So when the animals all come in at once, and they all leave at once, and then you're able to disinfect the, the barn and the pens uh, before new animals go in. Uh, biosecurity is very important, so controlling people and animal movement on and off the farm. Uh, these animals and people can bring in new pathogens uh, to your farm, and those can cause a big impact. Again, with all in and all out, we use disinfection. We allow those rooms to, to be heated and dried before we put new animals in there. 
uh, vehicles and trailers are a frequent avenue where new pathogens can be introduced. So things like trailer disinfection, baking, and heating can be important to limit the, um, the impact of pathogens on your farm. Um, and then so we want to have lines of demarcation so people that do need to visit the farm stay within areas that are low risk. Um, and then if we do acquire new animals, they're isolated uh, and they have a, what we call a controlled exposure, so they're able to become adapted to the pathogens that may already be on the farm uh, before they're introduced into the, the breeding herd. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, I'll wait for questions at the end. Um, here's some of my contact information if anybody thinks of anything in the next uh, few days or over break that they have a, um, a question they would like answered. Thank you.